It's time for Your Valuable Home. Okay, Ron, it is time for the feature segment. I believe we are starting the first of the America's coolest neighborhoods in America, correct? Yeah, we've been promoting this for weeks now, and the reason is it's a big deal. This is uh, probably the most ambitious thing we've ever undertaken, and it covers spots in the whole country. You did a lot of work on this. Oh, yeah. First one we're going to do here is in the coolest neighborhoods in America is Philadelphia and surrounding areas. I love the architectural genre that this represents in Philadelphia. Philadelphia's nearby suburbs are filled with many examples of mid century modern super super architectural style and here to take us on a tour of some of the very cool mid-century neighborhoods and standalone mid-century homes in philadelphia is craig wakefield craig was a dentist and he turned real estate pro his passion is mid-century modern and modern homes in fact he lives in a magnificent example of mid-century homes surrounded by sweeping gardens that he designed for one neighborhood in particular in this interview, Craig will be joined by Angel DLC, an interior designer who is in the final stages of renovating her mid-century modern home. So we've got people who are living it and doing it at the same time. Craig, welcome to Your Valuable Home. Before we get into specific examples of mid-century modern architecture, can you give us, say, a brief overview of how the genre developed in Philadelphia and some of the architects involved in mid-century architecture begin showing up in Philadelphia in the 1930s? Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I do think Philadelphia region is so fortunate to have so many really outstanding examples of modernism, starting with the PSFS Bank Building, which is recognized as the world's first skyscraper in international style. It was built in 1932 and designed by William Lascaz and George Howe. Howe and Lascaz also designed modern homes in the area during the time of construction. In 1933, Lascaz designed the Spreeder Studio for the graphic artist Roy Spreeder. Kenneth Day designed a few additional Bauhaus-inspired homes in the late 1930s in our region that are just exceptional. They really capture the look of early modernism. Craig, for our listeners who are not familiar with the Bauhaus movement, which I believe started in Germany in Berlin, can you offer a brief definition of that? The Bauhaus was an influential German art school that brought together principles of mass production and individual artistic expression. It had far-reaching influence on the modern movement worldwide. Buildings featured streamlined geometric shapes with almost no additional decorations. The influence from early European modernism can be seen so much of what was happening in the 40s and 50s in our region. There are large developments of mid-century style homes that were built to meet the great demand for housing after World War II. And there are also many unique international style mid-century modern homes that were designed by a number of outstanding architects. I really believe the mid-century homes of Philadelphia are special because of the use of local materials, such as stone and the incredible lush settings that really strengthen the, the indoor-outdoor connection. How many mid century and modern homes have you sold over the years? It's really been an amazing journey over the last 15 years to help have helped so many transactions of, of really significant modern architecture in our region. It's been such a privilege for me to meet so many original owners. I'm looking for stewards for their homes and also you know, meeting those who love the homes like I do and looking to buy them. I've been involved in many transactions with inter- internationally recognized architects such as Richard Neutra and Louis Kahn, George Dobb and Aaron Mitchell, but also there have been some really great homes by architects that are mo- more regionally such as Arthur White, Frank Weiss, Montgomery and Bishop, Erwin Stein, Robert von Gerbig, just to name a few. So it's it's been great. There's really been a lot. The houses that were built on the former Stotesbury estate. Edward Stotesbury, who had worked with J.P. Morgan, completed Stotesbury Manor in 1921, 300 acres just outside of Philadelphia. At the time, it was the third largest house in the United States. After Stotesbury's death, his wife sold 265 of the acres to Matthew McClowski. He was a builder in concrete at the time, doing a lot of large buildings and, and stadium-type structures. He originally planned to build about 1,000 precast concrete homes. The homes in the development were designed by architects Silverman and Levy. After about 50 of the precast homes were built starting in 1947, they found there were issues with water leakage and with the cement roofs. And the remaining built over the next few years were built with cinder block and frame roof. The original 50 have the unique ceiling grid of the prefab concrete. In that neighborhood, I helped a buyer and seller uh, buy one of the homes. Uh, the previous owner had been known for his retail store of mid-century furniture in Philadelphia. The one he had was enhanced by a carport that he kind of had this more of a streamlined look. I really think in the group of homes, you can see early European modernism and the, the design. 
Some of these were built in 47 issues with found with water the, the, leakage, right? The first ones were in 47. So the first 50 were the ones that were just prefab concrete pieces that were put together. And then the remaining hundreds were cinder block. He only did 50 of the poured cream concrete ones. Beat Angel DLC. Angel's on the phone, and I believe she lives in one of those first 50, and she's in the process of finishing the renovations on that house. Angel, your house was one of the sample homes, wasn't it? It was. It was built in 1947 and originally about 1,200 square feet. I've done some research, and it was originally owned by a couple who were both GIs from World War II. He was a captain. She was an army nurse, I believe. And they lived in the neighborhood until they died in the 70s. So it was pretty interesting that they lived long lives and stayed in the neighborhood. So what exactly are you doing or have you done to the house? So the house originally was one of the smaller versions. There were three versions of houses being built, and mine was the model home for the smallest version, about 1,200 square feet, three bedrooms. The kitchen was a Pullman kitchen, about 10 by 10. It had a 10 by 10 dining room. Living room was probably uh, 10 by 20, and then each bedroom went from about 20 by 10 or 15 by 20. In the 90s, I guess my former owner put on an addition to the back room. I've since opened up a lot of the walls. Because of the waffle slab ceiling structure, I was able to do that. I've got some experience in working in waffle slab construction in high-rise buildings in Philadelphia, so I knew how to uh, tackle that issue. But my kitchen and dining room are now one room, and my living room is opened up. There was a sitting room. I added a fireplace, and as Craig mentioned, the second phases of houses that were built with concrete block did include a fireplace, and the two-story version, which was phase two of the development, was also concrete block, and none of those houses have the waffle slab ceiling, so I'm very fortunate to have this. So I have basically fixed a lot of problems in the house with electrical issues. I've added a bathroom. I've renovated the bathroom. So I've taken it all the way down to the original structure in some of the rooms and got to see firsthand what the uh, prefab wall structure looked like and the pluses and minuses of living in a concrete home. So it's been very fun. But right now, you know, I'm finishing up the second bathroom and I've added more sliding glass doors out to a deck and it's sort of a terraced property, so I've had to build some large staircases out of timbers and concrete in order to uh, get to the lower portion of my property. Yeah, it's an outs- it's it's been, outstanding property. It's, outs- it's it been a it fun experience. It gives you a feeling of being in the Hollywood Hills. Yeah, with the exactly. With the architecture and, and the way the, the property slopes. And then recently I've been involved with some friends who have purchased properties in the neighborhood and helping them do some renovations as well. The uh, concrete panels were flatbed trucked into the site. The panels were erected within three hours. So it was a pretty interesting process back in 1947. And as Craig mentioned, Matthew McCluskey was the largest concrete company in the United States. So it was plentiful and it was something that he decided to do. And it was a very new practice in 1947, building houses out of prefab concrete. What's it like to live in that neighborhood? Well, I love it. It's a diverse neighborhood. Houses are not very close to each other. You know, there's a rule and a restriction of having 35 feet between houses. So that makes for a nice atmosphere of seclusion. My house is actually built in an area of the original estate where the groundskeepers and all the greenhouses Mm. were. So the trees are very, very old. In fact, one of my neighbors has an original cork tree on her property and um, it's really absolutely beautiful and I've never that? seen one before. Thanks for sharing your story. Now we got to move on to a place called Greenbelt Knoll in the city's Pennypack Park section. Greg, 
Yeah, it was a group of 18 modest mid-century houses set right on the edge of the park in a wooded section in northeast section of Philadelphia in 1956. Greenmount Knoll is significant that it was the first racially integrated planned development in the city and really one of the first in the country. The lead architect for the project was Robert Bishop with the firm Montgomery and Bishop. Landscape architect was Margaret Duncan. The houses are, are really special. They've been preserved by people who really love them. Isn't there a story behind the homes on Monk Road in Lower Murray and near Philadelphia? Yeah, the Dorns family, who owned Campbell Soup, had a large estate, and they sectioned off the end of their lot down at the end of Monk Road of 15 lots. They started selling them in the, the mid-50s with the agreement that a mid-century modern home had to be designed and built on it, uh, which I, I think that's pretty rare that people buy the lots with the requirement that they build a mid-century. So it really was a, a great little collection of, of mid-centuries, and I've sold homes on that section of Monk Road by Inga Britson and Erwin Stein, including the 1955 Eisenman residence. So they were kind of two to 3,000 square foot houses that were uniquely designed in a cluster. Okay, mid-century architecture also found a home in the city's East Falls section, didn't it? We're moving to the other side of the city now, right? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of rare to have these clusters of mid-century homes, but there were two streets off of Schoolhouse Lane in East Falls that had a lot of mid-centuries built. The tract of land was originally owned by Alma Morani. She was a surgeon and a sculptor, and she had worked with a realtor to sell the lots between the, the mid-40s and, and 1960s. You know, the buyers ended up being you know, a lot of her friends. They were notable citizens, and a lot of them were really active in social and progressive causes. So maybe that's part of the reason, but about a third of the homes were built in international models modern style, which is, I think, a really high concentration of moderns together. You know, it was a group of people who kind of knew each other and knew that other ones were being built in the neighborhood. One example is the 1956 Pedestal House by Montgomery and Bishop. They're the same architects mentioned before that had been the designers of Greenbelt Knoll. The base of the house is made of poured concrete, and it kind of extends out in all directions over a smaller base, giving the the appearance of a pedestal. In the evening, when the lights are on, the the main floor really appears to kind of float above the ground. It's it's really cool. And the lower level, you can actually see the exposed concrete ceiling. I mean, it was purposely exposed. Newcomb Montgomery, part of that firm, also designed a modern house for himself a few doors down. Frank Weiss, who trained under Walter Gropius at Harvard. Gropius was one of the main teachers at the Bauhaus after he'd come to Boston, taught at Harvard. He did about seven residences in our area, and one of them is in this cluster. It's called the Charles Oler House, and it was designed in 1953. The 1958 William Winkleman residence is also a few doors away and also designed by Montgomery and Bishop, and it's a really large house. It's about 6,000 square feet and has a really large, dramatic glass wall projecting out of the living room. So, I mean, there's really, it's an interesting collection of houses in that area. Yeah, well, there's another interesting collection of mid-century, too, in Sheltonham and nearby Abington area. That's your neck of the woods, isn't it? Yeah, it's, I lived in a different part of town, but I moved there really for the house, for, for the architecture. And, and, you know, definitely a number of buyers who ended up in this neighborhood were looking for really significant architecture and, and moved here to this area for it. And it's, you know, the area is really full of some cutting edge examples of mid-century modern homes. And I've, I've had the good fortune in this area to work with a number of the original owners. And I found that a lot of the original owners were prominent Jewish families that seemed to be somewhat connected socially and they, they knew each other. Louis Kahn's first residential commission was the Ozer residence. And it was designed in 1940. Another fine example is the 1947 George Dobb design belts residence. Dobb had worked with Lascaz on the PSFS building and had been recognized as one of six American architects in the 1932 seminal show that kind of introduced the term international style. The, Be- the belts residence is one I restored and resold this this year. Amazingly, it still had its 1947 kitchen and bathrooms intact with their original counters and everything. And I restored it with that in mind and kept even some of the original owner's furniture was still there. So the people who bought have a really fine, you know, authentic example. Frank Weiss did a number of houses, the same Frank Weiss that we've mentioned in East Falls. There's one that's a light colored brick house where the main floor is mostly glass and a really heavier second floor above it. So that at night, you, when you look at it, it looks like the second floor is just floating because the first floor kind of disappears. Hmm. And he designed that for his brother in hmm. 1949. I also had the honor of working with the Shepherd family for the sale of their home, which was designed in 1950. It looks to me a little like the precursor for the house in the movie, uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you know, on stilts and kind of up in the air, kind of overlooking the woods. My home is the Leibowitz residence. It was designed by Arthur White. 
1949. Matthew Leibovitz was a nationally recognized graphic artist. His work was heavily influenced by the distill movement and its use of primary colors. Uh, my home is mostly glass with a few large blocks of primary color in it. Uh, yeah, I'm also a, an avid gardener and had a lot of fun designing, installing extensive you know, gardens around my house to kind of heighten the indoor-outdoor connection. I started with blank slate and put in you know thousands of perennials. I, and I think that's really what made me love these houses in the first place. I was a, a gardener, had a house that I couldn't really see my garden and, and wanting to have a con- house that I could have a connection to my gardens really kind of introduced me to these houses and kind of began my love affair with mid-century houses. You did a magnificent job. The indoor-outdoor thing really comes off. It really does. I wish the house was mine, <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> and moving right along here, individually commissioned and designed homes in other parts of the region, there are plenty of them, aren't there? Yeah, there's, there's so many that I've kind of worked with over the years. I wish I, we could include all of them. It was an honor to represent the home that Airman Mitchell designed for his family in 1956. He was in partnership with Ronaldo Jurgola, and they did a lot of large buildings downtown and a lot of renowned buildings around the world, including Australia's Parliament Building. And it was the family sold it about 10 years ago. Uh, so it was the, f- the first transfer. The, the 1958 Hasfrick residence was designed by you know, internationally known Richard Neutra, and it's really spectacular. It's a classic Neutra with large floor-to-ceiling glass sliding doors. Another house that we included is the Wax residence designed by Erwin Stein. He did three homes that had a kind of repeating diamond pattern in the roof, uh, and this, that's one uh, at the end of Monk Road that we had talked about before. So they're kind of sp- spread out. Another favorite of mine is the Dow residence by Robert Von Gerber. Big. Um, it was completed in 1960, and it, it's it's really a stunning house. And when we sold it, it was the original family was still there, so all their furniture and, and art was still still in the house. Um, the entrance features a, a, a Japan, Japanese styled courtyard, so the primary rooms look into the courtyard and you know out to the outside of, of the yard. It's a beautiful house. Another house I was. It was great to work with. It was Louis Kahn's Escherich house. Escherich was the niece of the woodworker Wharton Escherich. It's an example of Kahn's architecture where he was that, that he's really known for, where it kind of has a monumental feel, although it's not necessarily large. This house is, is less than 2,000 square feet, but when you look at it, it has a real strong you know, substance. In particular... He designed homes all over the country. Didn't he? Didn't do a lot in L.A. and in Palm Springs. Am I right about that? Unfortunately, Khan did do a lot of designs for people all over. But he really, there really aren't that many. There are a few in other areas. There are less than ten in our region. You know, he did the Parliament Building in Bangladesh, and he did the Salk Institute in California. So he's known for in the museums in in Texas. I mean, he's really known for for his works that are mostly commercial. He did not do as many residential buildings though. Mid-century modern, it doesn't have the steam behind it, or maybe I'm wrong. Is there a reason for that? I think that what may have changed more is the furniture. So I think there are waves and in interest in the classic Saarinen pieces or the Eames chairs. And I think that kind of goes up and down in mm-hmm. time. I really fell in love with these in the early 90s. And certainly, and I started in real estate in, you know, in the 2000s. And from that time, there are always way more people looking for them than there are available. I think that there are a lot of people who really do want unique designs. And I think the, the world, you know, a lot of new, new modern design is actually using some of the concepts of these mid-century houses. So not so big, more connected to the outside, more open floor plans. I think the, the design style has not gone out of favor in any way and is as strong as ever. Um, so, but yeah, I think what you, you probably are right in that the design within reach kind of furniture, it kind of goes cycles in and out and people maybe are a little less interested in that. No, I was referring to like new classic mid-century developments. You don't see that much of that, do you? Well, it would be, it would be a development of new modern houses. So it's, it's expensive to build with a glass and other yeah. things. So I, I, I think they're now um, around the country and in Philadelphia, people are building beautiful modern homes with lots of glass that kind of similar look to some of the mid-centuries. Yeah, you yeah. see a lot of it. I was in, out in Montana not too long ago in uh, Yellowstone and places like that. A lot of uh, actors and actresses live there, so they're untouchable by the average person, like $20, 30000000 million, but it's there. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of glass. You have a lot of glass and it's just, they're stunning. Yeah, and unfortunately, I mean, the, the, the cost is just so expensive now, so I think it's prohibitive that they really are very expensive. From the first time I started to talk to you, it's easy to understand why mid-century modern uh, real estate is your passion. Please share with our listeners how they can contact you. 
definitely feel free to reach out to me, email me questions with any questions or, or thought on the Philadelphia Modern Houses. I'd be happy to just talk to them. I do have a lot of photos, more than we're sharing on my Instagram, at Modern Homes with an S, Philadelphia, all spilled out. So at Modern Homes, Philadelphia. Follow me, definitely. It's great. I've, I've put a lot on that and that's been a lot of fun. I also have a website. I have a history of the, the houses in the area and, and ones that I'm selling more recently. And that's Modern Homes, Philadelphia. Dot com. So I'd, I'd love to have people reach out and ask questions. I would advise everybody who's listening to this, go to that website. If you're in the mid-century modern architecture, it is there. Thank the both of you very, very much. We appreciate it. This was very, very interesting. Have a great 2023. Thank you so much for inviting me. Bye. That's this week's podcast. Your Valuable Home comes to you every week on the new Pod City Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, and all other popular podcast directories. If you want us to share your home improvement project or horror story, email me at kevin at yourvaluablehome.net. That's kevin at yourvaluablehome.net. And don't forget to tell your friends and family about Your Valuable Home, the weekly podcast that's all about building wealth in residential real estate and hiring the right contractor to do the right job at the right price. 